Hello, and welcome to Sustainability in Bacterial Endotoxin Testing, a holistic approach to conservation and recombinant technology presented by American Pharmaceutical Review and sponsored by Associates of Cape Cod. My name is Mike Auerbach, Editor-in-Chief of American Pharmaceutical Review, and I'll be the moderator during today's event. This webinar will present an overview of current conservation and the sustainability status of the horseshoe crab population in the U.S., new developments in recombinant technologies, an update on the regulatory framework around recombinant reagents, and sharing of comparability data. In addition, this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, click on the Ask a Question tab on the right side of your screen. Please take note, the right side of your screen also features an overview of this webinar and more information regarding our speakers. If you have a technical question during the event, click the Test Your Connection button at the bottom of your screen. From there, you can access additional webinar support. Finally, we encourage you to use the social media widgets beneath the webinar to share with your friends and colleagues. And now, allow me to introduce today's speakers. Veronica Wills is Technical Manager at Associates of Cape Cod and has over 13 years of experience in endotoxin testing and currently manages the global technical team at ACC and is based at ACC's U.S. headquarters in East Falmouth, Massachusetts. Veronica is a subject matter expert when it comes to endotoxin testing and often provides expert sessions at global events focused on BET products and processes. Most recently, Veronica has been speaking on the topic of recombinant technology as it relates to BET in the industry and abroad. Veronica is a key contributor to ACC's sustainability initiatives and a spokesperson on ACC's related projects, products, and services. Brett Hoffmeister is the LAL Production Manager at Associates of Cape Cod and has over 17 years experience in LAL manufacturing. Brett is also ACC's subject matter expert on horseshoe crab conservation and sustainability. Brett has worked to develop a number of critical sustainability initiatives at ACC, including ACC's Horseshoe Crab Sustainability Project. This exciting new program was launched in 2018 and has led to over 850,000 juvenile horseshoe crabs being released into coastal waters in Massachusetts. Brett works closely with fishermen, dealers, and regulators in his role at ACC. In addition, he manages internships with several colleges and universities, is a member of the Biotech Advisory Committee at Bristol Community College, and serves as Vice Chair to the Horseshoe Crab Advisory Panel of the Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission. Veronica and Brett, welcome to the webinar. Okay, thank you, Mike. It's my pleasure to be here today with my colleague, Veronica Wills, and we'll be talking today about sustainability and bacterial endotoxin testing. First off, did you all know that humans base their opinions and decisions basically 80% on emotions and only 20% on the facts and objective data? Even worse, if you're making a decision while being hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, or any combination of the above, emotions will almost 100% of the time push a decision perhaps in the wrong direction. The emotional brain is our default decision-making system, and today in this webinar, I'm excited because we have such a science-driven community, and I'd like to present and decipher data to you, present objective evidence, and place them within the scope of the holistic approach to sustainability and endotoxin testing. So first, a little house cleaning. The information in this presentation is given for the purposes of education and discussion. You should know it's not intended and should not be used as a substitution for regulations or regulatory guidance. And of course, any decisions that you make should be based on recommendations and guidance from the pharmacopoeia chapters and not in this presentation. The outline today, I'm gonna to cover population review of horseshoe crabs in the United States, some of the current conservation activities, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Veronica who's gonna cover recombinant technology and sustainability of LAL testing. One thing you should know is that ACC is really making effort to pursue sustainability excellence. You know, although we began with a, a catch and release program way back in the beginning of our business since 2011, we've really been taking review of our commitments and teaming with suppliers who share those commitments and collectively operating in a sustainable manner. Some examples I'd like to present are a water race and reduction reuse product that we have. ACC recycles over a million gallons of water a year. And then we repurpose that water locally at a trash and energy plant where it gets recycled to really cool some of the gases from that process. Ultimately, this means we use less water and they use less water. And it's a fantastic uh, project. We also 
are recycling a lot more product packaging. Our glues that we use are water-based. And of course, the inks that we're using are vegetable-based. So today, I really like to talk to you about horseshoe crab sustainability. Uh, as you know, if you're in this industry, we live by data integrity. And the information that I'm providing today was gathered largely from the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. This is the regulatory authority overseeing the horseshoe crab fishery, uh, whose goal it is to manage fisheries in a sustainable manner. And I'm using a lot of the data from their 2019 benchmark stock assessment. Now, this is a stock assessment done by dozens of scientists over the course of several years that really took a good hard look at, at the horseshoe crab fishery and the stock status. So some of the questions that we often receive are, are horseshoe crabs in the U.S. endangered? How is the population managed? Does the biomedical use of horseshoe crabs threaten that population? Will pandemics such as COVID-19 threaten the population because of the increased need for LAL? What do LAL manufacturers do to support conservation efforts? At first, it's important to understand that horseshoe crabs are managed as a fishery in the United States. The primary uses of the horseshoe crabs are as bait in the, in the bait industry for conch and eels, uh, primarily conch, where their uh, horseshoe crabs are cut up and put into pots where conch or, or the whelks enter. They can't get out very easily. And those animals are, are ultimately used in things like conch fritters, chowder, and, and they're particularly uh, useful these days in the sushi market. Of course, they're also used in a smaller capacity by the LAL manufacturers in the United States. There's four manufacturers operating five bleeding facilities on the East Coast. Secondary or smaller uses include uh, for Aquarius. Down in Florida, there's quite a few horseshoe crabs that are harvested. It's not an insignificant number, but they really don't have a good handle on how many that is. And there's also a research market, a small research market that still exists. The really good news is that Horseshoe crabs are no longer commercially harvested for fertilizer like they were in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, when literally millions of horseshoe crabs were destroyed for this purpose as a fertilizer and sometimes even livestock feed. So question one, are horseshoe crabs in the United States endangered? Well, the Fish and Wildlife oversees the listings of the animals in the U.S., and they've made no such claims that horseshoe crabs are endangered. And, and that's an important distinction. In 2016, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, listed the horseshoe crabs as vulnerable. So the IUCN is a group of scientists who monitor wildlife around the world, and they took into consideration a number of factors. One, that crabs are slow to mature. They looked at data trends up and down the East Coast. But importantly, they, they made a lot of projections. They estimated the use, they estimated sea level rise, and ocean temperatures over the next 30 years. So although I'd like to acknowledge that the horseshoe crabs are slow to mature they, and they need to be watched carefully because of that alone, this listing is based on a lot of assumptions. The fact of the matter is that there's studies, re more recent studies that have estimated there are literally tens of millions of horseshoe crabs in the U.S. Um, one in particular looked at the Carl Schuster Reserve off the coast of New Jersey. And, uh, you know, there's a very healthy population there of millions of horseshoe crabs. So how is that fishery managed? Well, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries oversees the fishery along the east coast of the U.S. Each state reports landings and population data to the ASMFC, and each state has representatives on a horseshoe crab board. The board is provided guidance by an advisory panel, a technical committee, and several subcommittees, including a shorebird committee, because there's a connection to the shorebirds which feed on, on female horseshoe crab eggs. There's what's called a fishery management plan that was devised in 1998. This is the first attempt at really managing horseshoe crabs. At that time, there was about, about 2.7 million horseshoe crabs reported harvested for the bait industry. The ASMFC opened up this fishery management plan and they set an immediate goal of a 25% of a reduction in harvest. Now, the FMP is a living document. It's, it's reviewed, it's rewritten every year, and there's addendums to that. And the subsequent addendums over time ultimately set quotas for the individual Atlantic states, and they continue to reduce removals from that fishery. Now, biomedical collection or harvest presents a problem for fisheries managers because we put horseshoe crabs back in the sea, and, and, and they weren't quite sure how to deal with that. So what they do is they assessed a mortality of about 15% of the crabs that we collect are assumed to die because of the combination of the process and the collection activities. 
So they set a threshold for that mortality at that time. And that threshold is about 57,500 crabs uh, and hasn't changed since 1998. And that was really an attempt to make sure that the, the ASMSC reviewed the fishery uh, if, if the biomedical estimated mortality ever exceeded or, or hit that threshold. So this is an opportunity for them to look at the fishery overall and decide if they needed to take any management action. That threshold should not be confused with a quota. It is not a quota. It is simply a trigger to review that fishery. And that's an important distinction. Now, the FMP compliance requires that each fisherman or dealer must supply data on cats to the state. So, for instance, we are considered a dealer, and I have to supply data uh, every month to the state regarding what fishermen we purchase crabs from, how many males, how many females, and, and what sort of shape those, uh, those animals are in. That data, in turn, gets reported to the ASMFC. Uh, the state also does surveys on, on the beaches and, and population estimates. All this data goes to the ASMFC. In the Delaware Bay, the FMP also includes something called the Adaptive Resource Management Tool, or the ARM. The ARM recommends harvest packages based on population dynamics of the horseshoe crab and red knots. So the red knots are known to feed on horseshoe crab eggs during a remarkable migration that they have. And the ARM uses this dual species management. This is a, a relatively new tool, and it, and it assesses the populations of both those animals before it recommends harvest packages. Within the ARM framework, female horseshoe crabs are not valued for harvest until a certain threshold is met. So again, we're using that word threshold. When that threshold is trigger of about 13 million females in that area are met, they won't consider using female horseshoe crabs for bait. So right now, this is a big conservation tool in, in that area. So other states along the Atlantic coast have tools in their toolbox. They can include things like size limits, prohibitions around speak pawn, uh, spawning periods, it's a male-only bay fishery in Delaware Bay, as we mentioned. There's no bay fishing at all in South Carolina and New Jersey. So those states have opted to prohibit bait fishing altogether in those areas. There's uh, protected areas off limits to fishing. They can be national parks and national seashore. They can be private property, uh, estuaries, and reserves that are in place. There are a, a fairly large number of places where harvest is prohibited. There's also daily limits and trip limits. So fishermen or boats fishing for horseshoe crabs are only allowed to take so many. The self-imposed quotas, for instance, Massachusetts has a quota set by the ASMFC of, of 330,000 crabs. Massachusetts has a self-imposed quota of 165,000 to be harvested for bait. There's limited permitting. This uh, horseshoe crab fishery is really watched very closely, and you must have a permit in the states that allow a harvest of horseshoe crabs. You must have a permit. And there's more things the states can do, like requiring things such as bait bags or other, other means to reduce the use of horseshoe crabs for bait. So I want to review that FMP using these slides. Uh, this is a good graphic representation of, of the FMP at work and of the fishery. So this is 1998-1999, and, and the 2.7 million crabs harvested for bait at that time are represented here in yellow. The biomedical mortality is represented down below in green, and this is the sum of all biomedical mortality. So this is the sum of observed mortality. So when we report to the state how many crabs came in our facility, we're required to report how many dead ones came in. It's also uh, it is, is a combination of the observed mortality and the estimated mortality. So that's represented down there in green. So the FMP set the threshold that's represented in, in red as their first reduction. In, in the bait harvest, and they set the threshold for biomedical mortality in black, and that's down below. And again, that's at about 57,500. So over time, as I stated, this is a living document. The FMP uh, made changes over time, and we see that the, the overall bait harvest in, in yellow or orange was drastically reduced. And over time, as the states either decided they weren't going to harvest for bait anymore, or they cut their quotas down, the FMP change in the bait harvest allowed by the ASMFC is referenced here in red. And then around 2005, 2006, the state quotas were pretty much set. Uh, they haven't changed since then. So I represented them here in orange. And this is really where the fishery lies to this day. With the ASMFC quotas in red, the state quotas in orange, and the biomedical mortality threshold down there in black. Now, if we fast forward, this is the entire fishery over, over the past 22 years since the FMP was in place. And you can see that there was, again, that drastic reduction in, in, in bait harvest, and it's remained relatively flat. Uh, the state quotas are in red, 
and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission quota is there in, in um, red and the state quotas are in orange. Somebody's going to ask about the biomedical collection. So I've represented that here in blue. Now, it's important to take note that prior to 2003, the biomedical harvest uh, is estimated. Uh, the ASMFC didn't require the biomedical companies to report that data until 2003. And that's really when we became a bigger part of the picture of the, of the fisheries management. So just take note that prior to 2003, those, those numbers are estimated. But this is really the state of the fishery. Now, when we talk about the fishery, they're talking about removals from that fishery. So when we combine the total mortality, and that is the mortality of the bait fishery, which is 100%, and the, and the total biomedical mortality, which is a combination of the estimate mortality and, and the observed mortality, that's represented here in green. And you can see that the, the mortality in the fishery has remained relatively stable since the early 2000s. I applied a simple linear trend line to that. You can see the drastic reduction here. And if you look really, really close, you'll also see that there's a trend line associated with the biomedical mortality. As I mentioned before, if that biomedical mortality exceeds the threshold, the ASMFC t takes into consideration management action. So a number of times, the biomedical mortality or the biomedical threshold has been exceeded, and the ASMFC has considered action. And one of the reasons they haven't made any major changes in how the fishery is managed is because of the total mortality. It remains fairly consistent and appears to be under control. The, the fisheries management plan is working. Now, a lot of people may take issue with that 1999, 1998 harvest. These were extraordinarily high years, without a doubt. I kind of treated those as outliers. We can remove them from the equation. And you'll see that even, even at a 20-year review of the fishery, you're looking at a, a drastic reduction in overall bait harvest, and you're looking at a very modest increase in, in biomedical mortality. So this is one component of the fisheries, is, is the removals of the fisheries. And what, what the other component is you have to understand recruitment, what's coming into the fishery. And for that, the states do a lot of surveys, there's beach surveys, there's market surveys. And what happens is they start to, the ASMSC starts to look at, rather than the individual states, they look at regions. And for instance, Massachusetts is in the region with Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine. Now, New Hampshire and Maine don't really have any sort of fisheries, although they do some market surveys and, and do some surveys along the beaches and whatnot. They have what's called a de minimis status. Their surveys don't add a lot of additional useful data to it. So a lot of those surveys get excluded from the, the summary of, of data that the ASMSC provides. Now, the summary kicks out this chart, which I'll explain in a second. It can be a little confusing, but if, if let's just look at the New England region as an example. If you look closely, you'll see that there's a five-year trend and a 10-year trend, an increasing trend in number of horseshoe crabs throughout the surveys used. You also see that in Rhode Island, there's a downward trend in five and, and 10 years, respectively. Now, what this summary does is provide a probability that the population is less than, greater than, or equal to that index year of, of 1998. So in Massachusetts, we have a very low probability that it's less than that. In fact, we're seeing more horseshoe crabs now than we have in 40 years. But in Rhode Island, the numbers are not so great. There, the probability is a little bit higher. So there's an average probability for each of these areas that's assigned. And when you assign that probability, they, there's a graphic representation using a, a stoplight. Uh, with green being really good and, and red being not so good, that's applied to the different regions. Now, I've represented those regions here on the map, and you can see the Northeast region is, again, kind of that yellow status quo. There's upward trends, there's downward trends. Delaware Bay region, same thing, upward trends, downward trends. It's important to note that the Delaware Bay region is really the epicenter of the horseshoe crab population in the United States, so it's, it's, it's relative. A status quo trend there is talking about tens of millions of horseshoe crabs. And certainly in Massachusetts, we have a healthy horseshoe crab population, but in, in relative terms, it's much smaller. I'll also make note that there are no biomedical companies operating in the New York region. So right now, you, you, the New York region has shown steady downward trends, but the biomedical companies are not operating there. So they, there's one that operates in the Northeast region, there's three that operate in the Delaware Bay region, and one in the Southeast region. I want to take a little closer look at those areas where the biomedical companies do exist. We're looking at Massachusetts, South Carolina, Delaware, Maryland. And these are areas where the biomedical companies are operating. And these graphs tell you a number of different things. The first thing you'll notice is that there's wild variability. From year to year, these surveys 
can show wild variability. And a lot of that is is weather driven. Boats can have a hard time getting out when it's windy or the water temperature can be cold and crabs can be hard to catch. So any particular spike upwards in, in one year is does not necessarily mean it's a great thing to celebrate. And and likewise a downward one year does not mean it's you know the end of the end of days for the horseshoe crabs. What's very important is the trend. Uh, so these these trends are important, and these are just some of the surveys. There's there's dozens and dozens of surveys, but I use these for the purpose of illustration. I want to be transparent about that. Uh, there's a lot of surveys that go into the assessment, but these tell a really interesting story too. Uh, the other thing is if you look at at the time series, we're looking at a 40-year time series in Massachusetts. You're looking at about a 20-year time series in a lot of the other surveys, and if you can. If you can see around the year 2000 is when that fisheries management started to really take place, you can see in some of these areas there, there is a downward trend. When you consider the life, the life cycle of the horseshoe crab takes about 10 years to mature, um, understand the fact that in these areas where, let's say in around the year 2000, they, they took some management action, you'll see that a lot of these downward trends were reversed in five, eight, 10 years. And right now that trend is upwards. In many areas, it's sustained. And in some areas, it never really trended downwards. But this is some of the data that the ASMFC looks at when they when they assess the population in the United States. And it's very clear that in the areas where the biomedical companies are operating, that we're seeing very positive trends right now. And we're seeing some population uh, indices, you know, representative of, of record highs, in fact. So that begs the question, does the biomedical use of horseshoe crabs threaten our population? Well, the fact of the matter is that biomedical losses or the mortality from that fishery is modest. It's, a, it's always been less than 13% of the bait landings, assuming that 15% mortality. And I think the, the biomedical manufacturers will tell you that that's probably a, a pretty high number. Uh, it's used for the purpose of, of fisheries management and, and kind of assumes a worst case. But that's a quote from the ASMFC uh, stock assessment. This is a fact. And I, I don't mean to throw the bait manufacturers under the bus. Bait landings are a sustainable and managed fishery here. They are part of the big equation. But it's also important to recognize that there was a study referenced in, in the uh, benchmark assessment of about 175,000 horseshoe crabs that were tagged in the Delaware Bay region. About 70,000 of those were bled at, at the biomedical companies in this area. And over the course of years, it, this, this study actually showed that biomedical bled crabs were surviving better in, in some cases, and at least as good as unbled crabs. So crabs that were tagged on the beach randomly were selected, and then crabs that were bled in the biomedical companies were selected. And those crabs, long-term survival is as better or as good as the unbled crabs. And that surprised a lot of people. And when you, when you really take into consideration what's going on, it's a little less surprising. Number one, the, the biomedical companies require healthy animals to make our products. We can't use a sick animal. Uh, so, so healthy animals come in. More importantly, healthy animals leave. You know, the, the, the blood draw is a relatively small amount of blood that comes from these animals. This, this study is consistent with you know, many other studies that of, of a much smaller scope that show that when the horseshoe crabs are bled, their survival is very good. And particularly if, when they're taken good care of, they're harvested carefully, the survival is excellent. So it's, it's a, also a fact that horseshoe crab populations are growing in many areas of the U.S., including the areas where the biomedical companies exist. So will pandemics such as COVID-19 threaten the horseshoe crabs? due to the increased need of LAL reagents? Well, the simple answer is no. And perhaps this crew is, or this gang is gonna know better than most, the horseshoe crab populations are, are stable and, and growing in many areas, but you probably know that very little LAL is used for testing uh, both in process materials and final products. So as, as we speak today, there was COVID vaccines being produced. The demands for the COVID vaccine are not really expected to impact the endotoxin testing market significantly. This is what we do. You guys know that. This is what we do. There are millions of LAL tests already performed annually. We've been through the swine flu. We've been through bird flu. We've been through H1N1, which was also a global pandemic. And albeit not to the scale of this, but there's inventory in place to help pharmaceutical drugs and help implant devices. Uh, this is probably going to easily absorb the demands of, of the COVID vaccine. 
So what do LAL manufacturers do to support conservation? Well, I'll remind you that you know we've been doing this for over 45 years, and we started with a catch and release policy with the horseshoe crabs. Uh, over time, we've refined the processes that ultimately reduce the mortality of horseshoe crabs, and studies have verified that we treat these crabs well, and and the, the fishermen treat these crabs well. In 2011, we partnered with regulatory bodies, other manufacturers, citizens group, fishermen, and dealers to document the best industry practices. So many of these were long-standing industry practices, but these can be found on the ASMFC website for reference. We've got members sitting on the advisory panel to the ASMFC. We've refined, refined processes to reduce the amount of lysate needed. I mean, this is a, a basic business fact. I mean, any business would, would look at ways of being efficient. We've reduced the overall number of horseshoe crabs needed by the industry by using bay crabs in the processing of LAL. So this is um, something that's endorsed by the ASMFC and, and, and local states. In Massachusetts, they call it the rent -a crab program. And we do a fair amount of that, um, which contributes to, to other things, which we'll talk about in a minute. But again, this is a practice that endorsed and is seen as a, a pretty good conservation measure. LAL manufacturers have tagged tens of thousands of horseshoe crabs. The scientific data that comes from those tagging studies is, is very important. We've refined processes to reduce waste. And we participate in educational programs. You know, personally, I go to camps. Uh, ACC sponsors uh, internships with a number of universities and colleges. And we go to high schools and elementary schools and things like that to talk to people about horseshoe crabs. We participate in beach and market surveys. We promote and participate in the Just Flip Them campaign. And you see, this is a big campaign down in the Delaware Bay region where, you know, horseshoe crabs that are uh, engaging in spawning activity end up upside down on the beach. It's a very dangerous thing for them. Tens of thousands of horseshoe crabs, maybe hundreds of thousands of horseshoe crabs are saved by this, by this campaign. There's also financial support for things like aquariums and organizations like the ERDG or the Ecological Research and Development Group, whose goal it is to help the four species of horseshoe crabs around the world. Okay, so ACC takes it a step further with the Horseshoe Crab Sustainability Project. Uh, this is a project that, that I'm happy to be part of. We have a patent pending system, aquaculture system right now that's capable of producing tens of thousands of horseshoe crabs. As I mentioned earlier, we utilize some of those crabs from the bait market and we've worked out a deal with the fishermen who donate, um, you know, some of those crabs. We're able to harvest gametes from those bait crabs. We fertilize them in vitro and then we introduce them to the system, which is capable of, of incubating, hatching, and then ultimately grow these crabs out for one or two instars. And then we release them to the wild. Since its inception in 2018, we've released over 850,000 juvenile horseshoe crabs in the waters of Massachusetts. In 2019, we expanded this program into Asia through, through grants. We were able to provide a system to a university, and uh, they've since released uh, two batches of horseshoe crabs. And this is a program that uh, once, once this pandemic gets behind us, I, I hope to be able to accelerate a little bit and, and get some more systems in Asia. Uh, this is really quite a remarkable thing to see. We have a video on our website that I'd encourage you to check out, but you can actually see the horseshoe crabs inside these fertilized eggs. And we release them looking like this. They are horseshoe crabs in every sense of the term. Uh, they're about the size of a pencil eraser. They're no longer benthic. They they, they are benthic. I mean, they, they go down to the bottom, they feed on the bottom, and we release them by the bucket load. Tens of thousands of these have been released, with tens of thousands more to come. And this is something we're really proud to do. So if you're using naturally sourced lysate, find comfort in the fact that LAL is made from a, a resource that is managed by scientists using data with a goal of continued sustainability. But it doesn't end there. Science being what it is has also provided us with another option. And with that, I'm gonna hand you off to my colleague, Veronica, who's gonna tell you more about recombinant products. Veronica. Thank you, Brent. That was an excellent overview of the horseshoe crab population. So I will continue here, and the additional science option that Brad has alluded to is our recombinant technology for endotoxin testing. Through our corporate project, we developed the first recombinant reagent for endotoxin testing. It's a recombinant cascade reagent. This happened in early 2010s, and it was launched in Japan in 2015 under the name PyroSmart, and it has been in use in Japan ever since. And I personally contributed and shared uh, a lot of data and information on the use of PyroSmart in the last year as well. 
PyroSmart has been included in collaborative studies and he, it has been also published on in a very large suitability study. Throughout 2020, we have been heavily engaged in technical transfer and production scale up of this technology in order to be able to share this with the global user. And about a month ago, we proudly announced that this recombinant reagent will be available commercially under the name PyroSmart Next Gen. ACC is the first or was the first company to offer FDA cleared LAL reagent. And soon we will be also the first company to offer for commercial use the first recombinant LAL reagent. Well, you may ask though, why did we bother with developing a recombinant cascade reagent when other recombinant reagents for endotoxin testing, such as the recombinant factor C reagent, is already available? Our goal was to develop an option where you get to keep the method and you only swap out the reagent. That means that you keep your current instrumentation, software, the setup, the data interpretation, and you don't have to train your technician to perform the test. So in that respect, the recombinant factor C assay is heterogeneous, while the recombinant cascade reagent or the uh, recombinant LAL, which we consider to be synonym synonymous to each other, it's actually homogeneous to the LAL test because it is based on the same cascade, so it is a direct replacement uh, for the naturally sourced reagents. So let's take a look at how that looks like or what that looks like side by side. On this slide, you can see to the left in the blue box the naturally sourced LAL reagent and the mechanism of action here, which has been very well described to be consisting of three cascade steps, starting with factor C, which very specifically binds to endotoxin and that um, triggers its activation to activated factor C, and that in turn activates factor B, which in turn activates proclotting enzyme. And then the clotting enzyme as a result will cause the readout, which could be either a change in turbidity or a change in a yellow color. On or a gel clot, gel clot test would then show a clotting phenomenon there. So compared to that, the recombinant cascade reagent is uh, consisting of exactly the same steps. Uh, the difference here is that the enzymes that are involved in those steps are fully recombinant enzymes. And the recombinant clotting enzyme then again reacts with exactly the same chromogenic substrate and that produces a yellow color as a readout. There is no variation for a, as a recombinant turbidimetric reagent, so this is a recombinant chromogenic reagent. The cascade has a huge job here to do, the cascade provides an amplification to the test. It allows us to measure the endotoxin at incredibly low levels, down to 0.001 EU per milliliter, which would be equivalent to something like 100 femtograms per milliliter. And so that is thanks to the amplification mechanism of the cascade. Now, with the recombinant factor C reagents, which are referred to as the RFC, we are lacking that cascade mechanism in there. So it is using the same recombinant factor C, which is, again, reacting with the endotoxin as the biosensor. However, then the signal has to be somehow amplified. And because the cascade is not there, it uses a completely different measure of detection, and that is a fluorometric assay in order to get down to the same level of activity. So here you can see the, the term, the homogeneous, so how the recombinant cascade reagent is in its mechanism in exactly the same as the LAL reagent. But we all know, and that has been talked about quite a bit, that uh, generally speaking, the recombinant reagents are considered to be alternative tests 
they are new tests, or still fairly new. And so they have been under testing, but they are not considered to be compendial tests just yet. So the question is, what exactly is an alternative test? And you could say that it's really the opposite of compendial. It's a test where uh, data that has been gathered to date is not considered to be enough to demonstrate comparability to the compendial test. So the validation has to be done either by the vendor and or, usually and or, the uh, end user as well. The validation could be done following USB 1225 or in the EP, that would be chapter 516. And it also means that the alternative test is not likely to be listed in drug monographs. The situation around acceptance of uh, the, reg the recombinant reagent has been somewhat dynamic in the last year or so. So this slide actually looks at uh, the situation, looks at the status of the recombinant reagents globally in the global pharmacopoeias, and it looks at it, what it is right now in 2020 and what is projected for 2021. So it is probably safe to say that the recombinant reagents are, uh, globally speaking, they are considered to be alternative. There is an exception, which I will address later. And um, it's, that is the case in the Japanese pharmacopoeia and in the United States pharmacopoeia. There has been an activity around their status, and uh, we expect that in 2021, they both of um, the types of the reagents, so recombinant factor C as well as recombinant cascade reagent, will be included in new chapters. The Japanese pharmacopoeia is expected to release a general information chapter in its 18th edition. And that is expected to include both types of reagents as well as the guideline chapter 1085.1. A draft is in a revision process. The comments on that draft have closed already. And we believe that it is targeted to release the effective version in November 2021. However, none of these chapters, even after they do become official, they will not be changing the status of both types of reagents. The situation in the European pharmacopoeia is different. The recombinant cascade reagents are alternative in EP. And uh, that is today, and that is also most likely going to be remain, you know, remain the situation in 2021. Uh, you may know that there is a new general chapter that was implemented in the European Pharmacopoeia. It's chapter number 2632. And this chapter was implemented in July 2020. And the meaning of this chapter is that basically it is considered to be a state-of-the-art chapter. So it could be actually used as a com the test under the chapter, which is the recombinant factor C test, can be used as a compendial test already and certainly can be used that way after the chapter becomes official, which is in January 2021. However, the situation is a little bit more convoluted in the EP, and I don't consider myself to be an expert on the European pharmacopoeia, and I actually should correct it when Dr. Emmanuel Charton, who is the head of Division B at the European pharmacopoeia department uh, at the EDQM, so she explained to me that the application of a new method uh, for testing drug products within the scope of the uh, EP is a little bit more complicated than this. So we'll try to review that together today here as well. So uh, within the structure of the European Pharmacopoeia, you can find uh, different types of chapters. You're going to find general notices, general chapters, you're going to find general monographs, and also individual monographs. The general chapters, which is what 2632 is, uh, describe the general methods, and they are not mandatory. However, they do become mandatory when they are referred to in an individual monograph. 
the individual monograph contains mandatory requirements about how to test that specific drug product. However, it's important to note that none of the individual monographs will be referring to Chapter 2632. So all individual monographs in the EP will continue to refer to Chapter 2614, which is the chapter that describes the use of the LAL reagents for endotoxin testing. So what does this mean for us? This means that if we are to use the chapter 2632 for drug testing, it will still be considered an alternative test. And Dr. Sharton explained this with a very nice parable, uh, which he called the empty shell concept, which I believe explains this really well. So if we are using the chapter 2632 um, just by itself, just to run a standard curve, for example, then it is already considered to be validated, so we don't have to run a method validation. But if we are using that chapter to test a specific substance, so the substance here would be basically the oyster now fitting inside the shell, so the shell being the chapter, we will have to run a full alternative method validation. So if we look at the example of insulin, for example, an insulin monograph number 0838 states that endotoxin testing has to be done following 2614. So if we decide to use chapter 2632, we can certainly do so, but we do have to show equivalency of the 2632 test to test 2614, which is the LAL test. So that equivalency has to be demonstrated. So it means that it is still within the scope of this use considered to be an alternative test. So hopefully that cleared it up. And it certainly doesn't mean that alternative tests cannot be used. It means that they can be used, but we have to show that if we are using them, we're able to get an equivocal decision on whether we are meeting the standard, and the standard being the individual monograph. And we basically have to be able to show that I am getting the same result with the alternative test as if I was using the compendial method. So this is actually a statement taken out of the European Pharmacopoeia General Notices. So what do I have to do in order to validate an alternative test? So there's three components to it. The first component is to show the analytical suitability of the test, which has been shown for 2632 per EP, but uh, it would have to be shown for other pharmacopoeias as well. So this means that we either follow USB 1225, which is a chapter for a compendial test validation, or EP 516, or ICHQ2 requirements. The second um, test that we would have to do is the suitability testing, which shows that whatever I intend to test with would be compatible for my product. And so this is the normal test for interfering factors that we're probably all used to. And it's described in USP 85 under that section and actually the same section in EP and JP as well. Now, the last part, and that's probably the hardest one, is the equivalency testing. And we talk these days a lot about comparability studies, which are touched on in the USB 1223 chapter and in the section on equivalency testing of quantitative tests, again, in EP 516. So in the next slides, I will take you through a validation as an alternative reagent to LAL, so validation of PyroSmart Next Gen reagent, which is, again, it's the recombinant LAL reagent. And this is basically building on data and facts that we already gathered from performing the same validation for PyroSmart reagent, which was a recombinant TAL reagent, where the T stands for tachypleus. So 
we started with our pilot validation studies and we were able to go through the first point, which is the method validation. And under our protocol design, we were following the ICAHQ2 requirements and we subjected the testing to two different assay conditions. Because PyroSmart Next Gen can be either used as a RAID assay, which is a V-mean assay, with a somewhat narrow range standard curve that starts at 0.1 EU per milliliter. And also it can be used as an onset time assay with a wide range standard curve from 50 down to 0.005 EU per milliliter. And we were following the requirements from table two in, like I said, in the IC. HQ2. So let's take a look at what were the requirements and then what we got for the results. So first we were looking at accuracy, intra-assay precision, intermediate assay precision, and linearity. All of these uh, test results that you're, you can see here in the column results, they were generated on a total number of five lots of PyroSmart Next Gen. They were generated for a total of 73 assays using six analysts, five different instruments, and three different labs. And this was over a one month testing period. So um, you can see that all of the results fall way, way within the criteria, the requirements for the assay. And uh, so the CVs, that's the correlation of variation that is populated. They were all calculated based on concentrations and they all fall well within what is defined. You can also see that the minimal requirement for the standard curve was 0 0.980 and we were able to, within all of these assays, the 73 assays, to have a minimum volume of 9.996, our value, which was for the answer time, and obviously the maximum value is one, which is the best curve that you can achieve. In the second set of data, we're going to be looking at testing of specificity, limited quantitation, and range. And this was done on a total number of three lots, 12 different assays, three analysts, two instruments, and two different labs over two weeks. When we speak about specificity, we are speaking about the ability of the test to measure endotoxin only. So to test specificity, we were looking at uh, running standard curves that were spiked with a known amount of, endo uh, of glucan, 1,3-beta-glucan, which is a commonly known and very well documented substance that actually causes enhanced or even false positive results uh, due to reactivity of glucan with a factor G, which is an additional protein in the LAL reagent. So the criteria was that there should be no significant difference between the tests that contain glucan versus those that did not contain glucan, and that is because the recombinant reagent does not contain the factor G, so it should not be, there should be no reactivity with glucan whatsoever. We were also looking at uh, the limit of quant quantitation for both the rate assay and the onset time assay for the uh, predefined criteria. And you can see here that the limit of quantitation of fovimine is uh, 0.002 EU per milliliter, which is usually achievable within about 30 minutes. And the limit for 005 EU per milliliter for the onset time test is, is 005, and that's usually achievable uh, within under one hour. So again, all of the criteria were met and uh, the performance of the test was very promising. And so we can actually also look here at, you know, from the statistical standpoint, evaluating the data, we can look here uh, to what was the specificity to endotoxin. And side by side, you have two plots that are determined for three different lots of PyroSmart Next Gen. And this is a regression analysis of uh, the results with and without glucan. So rate versus answer time. And so basically you can see that the standard curves are overlapping 
perfectly. So that means that there is no difference in the reactivity with and without glucan. So glucan does not co-react with PyroSmart Next Gen. Now, the other thing that really became obvious from the statistical analysis of the method validation data is a lot-to-lot -lot variability, or maybe I should say the lack of lot-to-lot -lot variability. So based on the results from five different lots of PyroSmart NextGen, you can see, again, overlapping curves. So basically, these are standard curves uh, determined for each type of assay. And because the curves basically come back with very close, very similar descriptors, which would be the slope and the y-intercept, it means that the variability between the lots is very, very low. So in fact, uh, there is an excellent reproducibility in the production of the lots, which is definitely desirable. So that is the method validation data. So next, we started looking at the suitability testing, and this was within our pilot suitability study. The protocol design was built around testing products in obviously a series of dilutions. And we tested four finished products, which may seem as a low number, but uh, remember that this is all built on the large suitability study that was done and published uh, by Dr. Moroy in 2019, which was done using PyroSmart, which is the recombinant TAL reagent. So in addition to this, we expanded the pilot study for perhaps somewhat unconventional type of drug products. We acquired just generally uh, used an accessible, non-sterile, over-the-counter drug products. There was a very good reason for this. The reason was that we were hoping that these products, or we were assuming that being non-sterile, they may actually contain endotoxin, which would be considered to be an autochthonous endotoxin. And so we obviously had to run a full suitability study on them as well prior to determining and measuring the endotoxin in them. The criteria for the suitability study as usual is that the positive product control recovery is within 50 to 200 percent. So let's take a look at what we got. So first we're going to take a look at the pilot scale suitability study using the finished uh, products. So here we were looking at acyclovir and insulin PBS buffer and leafy water. The reason for this is that this uh, range of products will be potentially or was talked about at least to be included in an EDQM recombinant study. And obviously these products were also included in that large scale suitability study. So when you look at the results side by side, and we're really evaluating it based on what is the non-interfering dilution, or NID, which is defined as the lowest dilution free of interfering endotoxins. So basically, I'm looking at what is the lowest dilution at which I have valid PPC recovery, and I really would like that as an end user, I would like that NID to be as low as possible because it means that the product interferes the least with my reagent. So side by side, if we look at PyroSmart and PyroSmart NextGen and the KCA, which is the kinetic chromogenic assay, which is an LAL assay, you can see here slight trends, and the trend shows that uh, the recombinant results are the same. So PyroSmart and PyroSmart NextGen give you the same result, and that they actually require slightly lower dilution, so they have a lower NID to be tested at. So that indicates that there is less of interference when used with the recombinant reagent. But it could be argued that this is only within the twofold error of the test, so it is not a significant difference whether I can use four, a dilution of four or a dilution of eight. But it's uh, it's looking good, and obviously you can see that the MVD is uh, 2,500. And um, for acyclovir, and it is 16,000 for insulin. So we're well below the MVD. So let's take a look at what we got for those exciting non-sterile drug products. So we tested a 
total of 16 of them. And you can see here a list of what they are used for. So there were some electrolytes, there were some salines, there were some eye washing solutions, there were some antiseptic solutions. And the mid column shows you what is the active pharmaceutical ingredient listed in those products and what is the concentration of them. And then on the right, we have uh, side by side the NID, so again, that's the non interfering dilution for Pyrosmart Next Gen and for kinetic chromogenic tests. So right out of the bat, we can see that there was one product, which was a skin cleaning product that actually was not testable. We would have to dilute it beyond 1 to 10,000. So that's a large dilution, and we actually did not dilute it beyond that. But at that higher dilution, we, we were getting some recovery. But basically, there was a very serious interference that was being caused by that product. So for the rest of the products we got, at least by the recombinant reagent, we got valid results. And so what we're looking at here is having the NID either of the same numbers, which means that the interference pattern is the same for recombinant as well as for the LAL test, and that's the case. But there were also two products out of uh, 15 valid ones where the recombinant assay is actually shows lower interference patterns. So we're able to test it, uh, sample number 12, we're able to test it at one to 100 dilution rather than one to 1,000 dilution, and that's a big improvement. Or with sample number 15 even, the 1 to 1,000 dilution required for LAL test was the highest we included on the test, and it was not enough to overcome the interference, while the recombinant assay result gave us a valid result at 1 to 10. So there's definitely, in two cases out of 16 or 15 valid ones, improved interference with the profile. This is more specific data on the sample number four, which was giving us such a high interference. And you can see that at the dilution of one to 10,000, we finally started getting some PPC recovery back around 30%. And this was for chlorhexidine gluconate. And uh, it was basically completely acting up the mechanism of the chromogenic assay. So, if we, we can take it one step further in the analysis here. So if we actually look at the obtained PPC recovery at the NID, so at the non-interfering dilution, you can see that nine products, that's in green, nine products out of the 15 valid products actually had an improved spiked recovery with the recombinant reagent. And that is pretty huge. What that means is that the spike recovery was actually very close around 100% rather than being 60, 70, 80%. So we were able to test those products at the same dilution, but we were able to actually get a better and a more solid spike recovery. There were, however, two products that um, had at the same dilution that had a slight decrease in the PPC. So it, it dropped, it would be around 60 or 70%, but it's only two out of 15. So there's definitely a, a huge potential for the use of PyroSmart NextGen as a recombinant cascade reagent for a wide range of products. And we will continue to build on this pilot case study, of course. So now we're getting to the equivalency testing. And as I alluded to earlier, this uh, is probably the most challenging for all of us in the industry. There is a lot of discussions and exchanges going on around how to build the comparability studies and how to do them. So in our pilot studies, again, we were looking at three different types of products here. So first, we obviously wanted to look at what can we measure for chemically purified endotoxin, which is a lipopolysaccharide. Then we were looking at endotoxin that is detectable in deionized water samples. Those samples are samples that have a fairly high count and so very likely to contain endotoxin, and that's why we decided to use them. And as you will see, we also measured endotoxin in those non-sterile drug products. So the protocol for this comparability study was built around the use of RSC only as the reference standard endotoxin using validated systems 
coordinated testing so that we can test as much as possible at the same time. And obviously using endotoxin-specific LAL reagents. And then the results are going to be expressed as a relative recovery percentage, where the expectation is that the relative recovery falls, again, within 50 to 200%. So before we get into the data, actually, I do want to mention here the reason why we put a big emphasis on comparability studies. Even though the recombinant LAL reagent is homogeneous to LAL reagent, they're not to be considered the same. They're not the same because LAL as an in vitro test is a biological product. And you can see here that it's a product made as a lysate. So that's the last L in LAL stands for lysate and the A stands for amebocyte. So it's a lysis of an amebocyte where amebocyte is a blood cell from the horseshoe crabs. And the amebocyte directly reacts, basically adheres to endotoxin, or we should probably say adheres to a gram-negative bacterial cell wall. And that triggers the blood clotting mechanism, which we're essentially harvesting in our in vitro testing. However, it is a quite complex mixture of macromolecules. These are proteins, glycoproteins, peptides. And this micron picture image shows you that inside the amebocytes are various structures of a lower or high density. Some of them are small, so those are called large granules. And they were shown to uh, contain at least 25 different components some of which is the well-described factor C, G, B, procoding, and some coagulogen. But there are serpents in there, and there are many other different um, types of enzymes that upregulate the clotting mechanism. And uh, in the S granules, uh, we can find small peptides that have antimicrobial activities. So this is a very complex system, and I don't believe that it is well described how it actually, what the role it plays um, exactly during the blood clotting mechanism, which in vivo happens extremely quickly within about 90 seconds. So that being said, we really want to have a high confidence in the fact that whatever we are measuring using the recombinant limulose amebocyte lysate, that we're actually also able to measure the same amount of endotoxin using the naturally sourced lysate. So that's why we go through the troubles of looking at and, and producing a lot of data that I will be presenting to you next. So first, we're starting off here with actually uh, going back to Dr. Moroy's article, which again was published based on the use of the PyroSmart reagent. He looked into a panel of lipopolysaccharides, 13 of them, and uh, looking at uh, the recombinant LAL, I'm uh, sorry, recombinant TAL reagent, and looking at a different type, actually three different LAL reagents as well. And the conclusion was, as you can see here, that the reactivity of the different uh, LPSs was very much comparable between uh, the LAL and the recombinant reagent. So out of this panel, we took two LPSs and we subjected them to testing by PyroSmart NextGen. So we took Pseudomonas aeruginosa 10 LPS and Helicobacter pylori. Uh, it was tested by a kinetic chromogenic test and a, also a kinetic turbidimetric test. And then we calculated uh, the mean LAL value for those two LAL assays and then used that mean value to calculate the relative recovery where the nominator is the recombinant cascade result. So you can see that the recovery was uh, 86 and 173% respectively. Um, and that when we are taking into account the reactivity with the turbidimetric reagent. However, if you look closely and just compare 
chromogenic to chromogenic, in this case, so recombinant chromogenic to naturally sourced chromogenic, uh, the relative recovery would have been even much closer. It would have been uh, over 100% in the first case, and it would be about 95% in the uh, Helicobacter pylori case. So needless to say, that is looking pretty good to us, and it shows that PyroSmart Next Gen can measure LPS. However, no one really cares about LPS. What we do care about is can we measure endotoxin, real endotoxin in real environmental samples or in even better in drug products, which we will get to later. So what we did was that we chose to go after the ionized water samples. It is Low hanging fruit because obviously these types of water samples, they're pre treatment samples, and so they are not microbiologically controlled. They do not go through TOC testing, so um, they could be quite complex as well. However, we decided to test them because they're very much likely to contain quite a bit of endotoxin. So what we did with them is first we ran it uh, with multiple LAL assays. And uh, so on this slide, it shows the kinetic chromogenic versus the kinetic turbinimetric results for all nine different samples. Uh, and these, these are waters uh, retrieved from various sites. So you can see that we have a really good alliance between the two LAL assays. Uh, the only sort of troublemaker here would be the sample number three, where the chromogenic result was actually about 50%, uh, so half of the uh, turbidimetric result. But that's within the error of the test anyway. So, and that is really what the only thing that we're trying to achieve here. So two different assays. Uh, two different LAL assays give us good results uh, with 50% for sample three. So now we obviously ran it uh, using PyroSmart as the recombinant TAL assay and PyroSmart NextGen as well. Uh, the blue line here represents the mean value of those chromogenic and the turbidimetric results. And uh, the green line represents PyroSmart Next Gen. So you can see that the green and the blue are basically overlapping each other for all of the samples, including the troublemaker, number three. And PyroSmart, being the recombinant TAL assay, is just slightly lower for sample number three, and it was actually at about 54%. Uh, relative recovery, which we can see even better on the following slide. So this shows us here actually the relative recovery side by side for both of these uh, different reagents. So again, the goal is that the, all of the samples, so all nine samples, have a relative recovery within the box, and the box represents 50 to 200 percent. So we achieved that with PyroSmart um, as an RTAL assay. But you can see that the recovery is actually uh, incredibly improved when using the PyroSmart Next Gen reagent because eight samples out of nine actually had a recovery around 100%. So, um, and one of them was a little over 130%. So that is very promising, and it shows that uh, PyroSmart Next Gen being an LAL test, so using the genetic sequence uh, from the limulus polythemus horseshoe crab seems to be definitely closer to the LAL than the recombinant TAL reagent. So let's take a look now at the results of the non-sterile drug products. So this is, again, the same products that we subjected to the suitability testing. And then for the results obtained at the NID, at the non-interfering dilution, we then quantified how much endotoxin they had in them. This was, I must say, a little disappointing for me, because fortunately for the general public user, and unfortunately for me, these non-sterile drug products happen to be much cleaner than expected. So you can see that out of the 15 valid products, 13 of them did not have any detectable endotoxin in them. Two of them had some detectable endotoxin. So the dry nose spray, 
contained as measured by the recombinant LAL assay, it was 0.49 versus 0.9, which is a 54% recovery, relative recovery of the endotoxin. So that's that's well within. So we're happy with that. And sample number 16 was interesting. And I will talk about that a little bit more on the following slide so that we can see the data a little better. So let's take a look at sample number 16 in more detail. This sample had an active ingredient, which is a sodium carboxymethyl cellulose. And um, that is known to be a plant material and thus potentially a uh, containing a significant background of 1,3-beta-glucans. And this is exactly why we chose the sample for this panel. So when tested side-by-side side between the recombinant and the chromogenic test, uh, you can see here at those different dilutions that the chromogenic assay measured about mean value of 4.5 EU per milliliter, with PPC recovery being somewhat jumpy around, though valid while the recombinant test did not detect any endotoxin and the spike recovery being very close to 100%. So based on the composition of the sample, we obviously also chose to test the sample using glucatel. Glucatel is a reagent that measures 1,3-beta-glucans only. Uh, so it's a reagent which is based on the LAL cascade, but with the factor C removed. So there is no co-reactivity with endotoxin. And the results from the glucatel reagent at, as you can see, quite high dilutions gave us a final value of 67.5 nanograms per milliliter. That is a very high and quite unusual glucan background for a drug product. And so it indicates that the glucan present in such a high concentration was not all blocked by the use of the beta-glucan blocker. And uh, that's why we have a difference in what was measured by the recombinant and what was measured by the chromogenic assay. We will follow up on the sample with a confirmation testing a following an enzymatic digestion of the samples. Because if we use a endoglucanase uh, to digest uh, the 1,3-beta-glucan in the sample uh, and test again by the LAL assay, we shall see whether the signal that was measured is diminished, and that would be the expectation. But as of right now, it, it definitely, the beta-glucan story is, is a quite difficult story to tell. So basically, all in all, when we look at this data and these pilot studies, uh, we really can see that it's, it's very promising. We can see that there is definitely an indication that the recombinant LAL reagent provides results that are very close to the LAL reagent. And so with that in mind, we do know that our work has not ended. Our work actually just about started. The focus of the discussion about recombinant reagent is primarily on data integrity, and that is in all its aspects. Before we can make a transition from naturally sourced LAL reagents to recombinant reagents, there are specific steps that have to be followed, and there are specific requirements, some of which may be local. And so in order to support this transition, obviously we need data, we need objective evidence. And here at ACC, we are dedicated to provide and generate that evidence and demonstrate in comparability studies how recombinant LAL reagent compares to the naturally sourced reagents. So let's take a look at what our plan is. So it's very critical, obviously, to develop an extensive and a robust comparability study. We can build it on the pilot study, and we're also considering to include additional, even than those non sterile drug products, and maybe one day we are going to get lucky with getting those that have some detectable endotoxin in them. And that is honestly the biggest challenge for us, is to have and, and demonstrate the ability of the recombinant reagent to measure the autoxin's endotoxin, because samples that actually come from manufacturing production 
samples that do represent relevant drug products and contain autochthonous endotoxin are very hard to come by. So having a large study that is robust and that would be powered for appropriate statistical analysis is the number one focus of our activities here. And we also would like to run it as a multi-lab study in order to demonstrate robustness over, again, a large range of sample types. And ultimately, the purpose here is that we want to demonstrate the validity and suitability of PyroSmart Next Gen for a majority of sample types. The goal is that we will provide the data that was suitably powered and you know, suitably statistically analyzed in order for the recombinant reagents to be one day included in compendia and in monographs as appropriate methods. So it all lays in the hands of data. So this is where we kind of need uh, help as well, because in our next step, as we're finalizing the study and we're finalizing the protocols, um, we really would like to establish uh, a level of interest in participating in the study out of the global users. And so we would like to really hear from you. If you would like to participate in this comparability study, please do visit our website at pyrosmartnextgen.com, complete the survey on this website and indicate to us your level of interest in the study. And we will then coordinate with you. We will work with you under an appropriate agreement, terms and conditions, so that we can hopefully accept your samples and we can test your samples and we can figure out the logistics of all of that. And we can also agree on basically how the study would be structured and how the data would be used. And what is the output of this study? Well, for us, the most exciting thing is that we really want to demonstrate how PyroSmart NextGen is appropriate for its intended use. And for you, what you get back in return is that you will find out whether your samples are compatible with recombinant reagents, if that's of interest. You will find out if the interference profile is the same or perhaps maybe even better with the recombinant reagent and whether there is any measurable endotoxin, hopefully, and basically what those levels of measurable endotoxins are going to be when compared to the naturally sourced reagent. So with that in mind, if we go back to the beginning of this webinar when Brett was talking to us about the holistic approach of sustainability. I would just like to conclude here that obviously sustainability is a huge topic and it runs through all aspects of our lives and it's, it's very complex. Here at ACC, sustainability is at the core of our business and uh, we implement it in different areas. We implement the general corporate sustainability initiatives within our everyday production within the Horseshoe Crab Sustainability Project, within supporting the Red Knots program. And we really see the use of recombinant reagent PyroSmart Next Gen as an additional tool in, so to speak, your sustainability toolbox. And based on that, we are positive in that PyroSmart Next Gen will be the next addition to the sustainable future of LAL, but obviously not before the comparability studies will be concluded. Uh, PyroSmart NextGen clearly has many benefits over the uh, naturally sourced LAL reagent because in the decrease in the test variability, because of no cross-reactivity with beta-glucan, uh, while you get to keep the method, while you get to do exactly the same thing in the lab as you're used to, and but just getting there faster because it is a faster test as well and it is a sustainable test. So leveraging the benefits of the LAL assays and coupled with the enhancements and uh, better performance in complex samples, we really believe that it is worth embarking on the big comparability and robust comparability study. And having generating the data from the study, we believe that that's going to help in acceptance and in using recombinant reagents in the future. 
So I do realize that today we really presented here a lot of data, a lot of objective evidence between breath and eye. And hopefully it was presented in a way that will allow you to make your decision on sustainability of endotoxin testing based on facts only, not on emotions. Thank you very much for your attention. And now let's open it up for questions. Thanks, Veronica and Brett, for your very informative presentation. I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit any questions you have for Veronica and Brett in the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. Now, let's take a look at our questions. So our first question is, how would moving to an LAL alternative affect conservation efforts for the horseshoe crab? Is it possible that this would have a counterproductive effect on conservation efforts? I will take this, Mike. Thank you. I can tell you that here at ACC, we will remain committed to horseshoe crab conservation and our holistic approach to sustainability. And that is going to be despite whether the recombinant reagents will become used worldwide and across all of the industries which we really do not expect. We expect that uh, LAL, so the natural resource reagents, as well as the recombinant reagents will be used out in the field and we will support both and we will continue with our holistic approach for years to come. Excellent, thank you, Veronica. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Does PSNG use any raw material from the horseshoe crab? So the PyroSmart Next Gen reagent does not use any raw material from the horseshoe crab. It is a man-made reagent containing the proteins that are derived or expressed from the DNA sequence of Limulus polyphemus. So it really is based on the uh, genetics of the horseshoe crabs, but it does not come in contact with the horseshoe crab, um, the raw material here. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks again, Veronica. Uh, our next question is, what is the mortality rate for the 850,000 horseshoe crabs grown in vitro and released in Massachusetts? Well, I'd be happy to take that question. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. We really don't know right now because horseshoe crabs shed their shells while they're growing. Uh, physical tags are difficult. Chemical tags may compromise their ability to hide. What we do know is that some of the studies suggest that, you know, Mark Botten had done some work that maybe one out of 10,000 horseshoe crabs survives their first year. Uh, so through this program, we take them up until a third, roughly around the third month of their life, and we release them in, in protected embayments uh, permitted by the state. So we really protect them through their most vulnerable stages or some of their most vulnerable stages of their lifetime. And I think it's safe to say at the very least, uh, what we release represents, you know, millions and millions of, of eggs. Uh, but as of right now, we don't know what the mortality is, but we are working with the state to try to establish uh, how successful that is. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's a, a follow-up question to that. Uh, are the horseshoe crabs tagged? Okay, so again, the, the, the juveniles are not tagged. Uh, the adults um, up and down the East Coast are tagged by the Fish and Wildlife Service is one of, as far as like the biomedical crabs go in Massachusetts, we mark them with a, a non-toxic paint to prevent them from being bled again. So the, there are a number of different sorts of tags and reasons for those tags. So uh, in mm -hmm. some cases, yes, they are tagged. Thanks, Brett. Our next question is, uh, can you confirm if the reagent used in collaborative studies is different from that being launched? I understand that the earlier reagent was TAL derived and the launched one will be LAL derived. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So in the initial collaborative studies that were performed back in 2017, 2018, 2019, all of those were done with PyroSmart, that is the original reagent, which is based on the genetic sequence of the Tachypleus, which is the Japanese horseshoe crab. And following our technical transfer, so going forward, all of the studies will be done with the recombinant LAL reagent, which is called PyroSmart NextGen. 
next gen standing for next generation. So going forward, and the last part of the presentation was all done with the PyroSmart next gen reagent. Thanks, Veronica. Our next question is, uh, will new instrumentation be required to use PSNG? Uh, no. So for the PyroSmart next gen reagent, there is no need to obtain or acquire any new instrumentation. You keep the same instrument being the absorbance reader, and you keep the entire method that way, and all of the procedures remain the same as well. Terrific. Thank you. Our next question uh, is, when will PSNG be commercially available? So PyroSmart NextGen is projected to become commercially available sometimes in Q2 of 2021, and we will definitely provide additional details and announcements as we get closer to the launch. Thanks, Veronica. Let's move on to our next question. Where is the estimated 15% horseshoe crab mortality rate derived from? Uh, that's another good question. I'd be happy to take. Uh, the ASMFC uses, they use the review of a number of peer reviewed papers uh, over the course of many years, not all of which use you know, the BMPs or, or processes that really closely mimicked the biomedical company. So during the last assessment, they decided to include all of the studies, regardless of how closely they mimicked it, because that was the best available data. I will say that the studies that more closely mimic the actual process, you can see that that mortality rate is, is almost cut in half. So I, I think most people in the industry would tell you that that's relatively high, but for the purposes of, of fisheries management, again, it covers kind of a worst case should events happen that would raise the mortality. Terrific. Thanks, Brett. Unfortunately, uh, that's all the time we have today. Any unanswered questions will be answered via email. Uh, we'd like to thank Veronica and Brett for sharing their knowledge with us and also offer a special thank you to Associates of Cape Cod for sponsoring today's event. Please keep a lookout for an email containing a link to view this webinar on demand and to share with your colleagues. Thank you for attending the webinar and please enjoy the rest of your day.